This is Collected Clan, episode 16. You just have to get personal with people and you have to tell them the truth. Everybody that sits in my chair knows that there's two things that they are guaranteed. I'm not going to lie to them about their hair ever. And I'm never going to sell them a product that they don't need. Welcome to another edition of Collected Clan, the podcast featuring conversational biographies of relatable people with real stories of triumph and tragedy, plus successes and setbacks. I'm your host, Gregory Byerline. People often come and go, but these people are the company you keep. Everyday people making their mark. My guest today is Tony Caldwell. Tony is a renowned hairdresser, entrepreneur, and fantastic conversationalist, as one would expect to experience when sitting in a salon chair. We talk about his first-hand experience behind the scenes at many New York Fashion Weeks, his path to owning his own salon, how he approaches each individual client who comes to him to look their best, plus the fragility of the human body, the Me Too movement, and several other unexpected twists. And as always, we feature a non-profit spotlight selected by our guest. Kick back and eavesdrop on this conversation as if you were sitting in a salon chair. Just like his work, this one is a unique one. Visit the show notes to see photos of Tony's creative hairstyles and photos of some shoots we've done together at collectedclan.com slash Tony Caldwell. And finally, in every conversation we have, I encourage my guests to be real and raw if they so choose. Authenticity is essential. Sometimes that includes certain words or expressions that may not be suitable for young or sensitive ears. This is one of those episodes. And now, here's the conversational biography with Tony Caldwell. I first would like to hear some stories from you outside of your chair about your experience with and at New York Fashion Week. How did you land those gigs and uh, what was that experience like? (laughs) It's funny. Anybody that really hears Fashion Week or New York Fashion Week or Miami Fashion Week or anything that has the term Fashion Week included in it, even National Fashion Week. They think that it's this really glamorous thing that people get to do that all hairdressers want to do. And then when you go and do it, it is fun. It's an absurd amount of work. And what people don't ever really get to see is the countless hours that the people that come up with the hairstyles in team with the the designers and the makeup artists and whatever, what they don't what people don't get to see is just how much goes into the creation of a show. So a show will be 15 minutes, but it'll be four hours of prep before a show. And it's taught me a lot of really interesting lessons about, about life, about how to perform under pressure. One of the greatest lessons I was ever given was actually the very first show that I ever did for fashion week up in New York. And it was a company called Garcia Velez, and they're amazing, amazing men's clothing. Just beautiful clothes. And the key hairdresser is my buddy Lewis, who's from out in uh, California. And he had nailed the look that they wanted. And there was only four of us that were actually working the show with Lewis. And we, we, we totally killed it. We did exactly what the designers wanted, what they had come up with. The models look spot on. And... <laughs> we finished early and the lesson was is never finish early because as you know with creatives creatives typically are um insecure they are just very 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 critical of themselves so when they saw that there was time that automatically like registered to the to them that it wasn't right so we had to completely redo everything and have it ready to go by time of the show which I've learned is a very common thing in fashion week. They will, they will come up with the idea that they think they want. And then when they see it all put together, they hate it. And then they expect the hairdresser team to be able to change it the way they need it to be changed in the final minutes. And it's, it's usually a shit show. I mean, there's tons of people back there. There's models running around, people doing wardrobe. It's, it's chaos in so many different ways. So they go in with creative in mind. How, how many days or weeks out is this creative brief created or is it day of? 
<clears throat> no, it's never ever day of. Um, well, it's, I guess in a way it is because they change their mind. However, it's months in advance sometimes. It depends on how big the company is. You can have smaller companies with a, with a lesser budget do it much closer to show day. You can have it, you know, you can have the big, big shows where they're planning it for a year. It all, it all changes. It's a constant circus. So really and truly, I don't really have a way to answer that specifically. I will say, though, that it's, it's usually a couple weeks out before they do it. That's, that's like the most average time. And then it's tweaked a million times in between there, so... Yeah, so the stylists from wardrobe and hair, yeah, I mean, well, obviously, I would think the wardrobe doesn't change, but the well, no, hair, it, the it, hair and makeup it, would change. Yes. Yeah, no, wardrobe, wardrobe changes just as much as anything else because models, you, you know, they make they make a piece of clothing on a mannequin, basically on a hanger, and then they have to fit it to a model, which then they have to change it. And then when they actually put it on the model, then they, you know, it drapes a little bit different. It's, it's a really big undertaking for them to produce clothing and all the models look differently. You know, some of them are super, super skinny. Some of them are more shapely and, you know, more swimsuit, I guess, would be the way I would describe that. And that all matters. That all makes the clothing, makes the look different. It's a really detailed, there's a lot of moving parts in it. I never realized that. I thought it was just clothes and beautiful women and bitchy people running around telling people what to do. And it's so not like that. It's, it's a for real industry. There's a reason why the big, big houses make so much money. So if a designer is going to walk 24 pieces down the runway, are they coming with 48? Are they coming with 36? Are they coming with more than 24? I would imagine, right? Um, yeah. I mean, they're going to come with a couple options, but they pretty much know what they're going to do and they will alter stuff there. They have their ateliers with them. So there's people back there with pins and thread and I mean, they're, they're, it's, that's what I'm saying, man. It is a shit show backstage because there is people doing all kinds of stuff and there's rules for us as hairdressers because of that. Like we can't use certain equipment backstage because God forbid somebody bumped into you, you know, for example, we use straight razors a lot. We can't use those backstage because it's a, basically a samurai sword. Well, sure. You have to be conscious of the way you're using a curling iron. Again, not good if you like touch somebody's face with a hot tool, you know. So there's there's a lot to it. It's not as glamorous in any way, shape, or form as people think it is. I was just in LA doing. There is a line in a uh, very very famous line called Moschino and Orbe himself, which is I work for a company named Orbe, and there is an actual gentleman himself, and he was the key hairdresser for that. He was one of the best hairdressers in the world, and we got the got the job and I had the luxury to go out and help do that. And that was, that was an experience. That was, this will be my second story. So, <laughs> was it, was it a good experience or was it an, Oh Lord, what have I done experience? No, it, it was a wonderful experience. It was so much fun, but it was, when I said it's an absurd amount of work, so if you can imagine a max time frame of probably 20 minutes, I've never seen a fashion show last that long unless they like purposely walk super slow. But the show was supposed to start at seven and we started prep at three o'clock. And when we prepped all, it was supposed to be a ton of wigs for this thing. And we prepped the whole night before until two o'clock in the morning. And at that point in time, when we finished at two o'clock in the morning, we had 56 looks and 36 models that we knew we had to take care of the next day. When we showed up, there was 90 looks. Yeah, I said that wrong. There was 90 looks and there was 56 models. They'd found 20 models miraculously somehow overnight that they wanted to throw in the show. So we had to come up with stuff to do for them day of. And then we got everybody prepped the way that the stylist wanted it. And then she made us take down half of what we did. And with that many people, I mean, the show, I think the show started a half hour late and it actually had nothing to do with us. We had gotten it all done, but that was when I got to watch a master, the best of the best of the best, like the Mozart of hair work with a stylist that was being super difficult. And they were like really good buddies and it didn't 
phase him. It didn't alter him. It was just like it was another day, and we all just did our thing. He never was upset. I was like, I'd never work again. I'd tell her to go fuck herself and move on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I could not deal with that. That's in that role at this point in time in my life, I am exactly where I'm supposed to be, which is there to support, and I get to do that with some really big people and do some really fun stuff. However, if I was to do that, I don't know how I'd handle it. I, I really day in don't. and day out. Oh, man. It's something else. You get paid a ton of money to do it, but I don't think there's any money to deal with that that I would be willing to take. So how did you end up in that world? For listeners who don't know, I mean, we're talking about fashion right now, but really yeah. the, the corner of your world of fashion is the hair portion right. of that corner. And I've got to be honest, when I first met you, you did not strike me as a hairdresser. Why is that? And frankly, every time I see you, even at your own salon, you don't strike me as a hairdresser. Yeah, I get that a lot. How did you end up in this field? Well, first part of this story, the first chapter, I was 16 years old and I've always been very creative. Everything I do, I was trained in classic portraiture, painting, paintings like the Mona Lisa and what have you when I was very young and I've always been into anything creative, design, architecture, what have you. And I remember I was 16 years old and I went and got a haircut from my hairdresser. And she looked at me. She's like, you know, you should really be a hairdresser. Men make a lot of money being a hairdresser. And I was like, why would I want to do that? Because at that point in time of my life, I was um, getting recruited to play college football all over the country. Now that and, I can see. <laughs> yeah. Well, what most of your viewers don't know is I'm a giant and I really don't fit the bill in any way, shape or form. I, I am totally a dude's dude and, you know, I, I, I don't look what I'm interested in most of the time. I guess there's a stereotypical image and I just don't fit that. Anyway, I was recruited to play ball all over the country and I ended up getting a severely bad case of depression and lost all my scholarships. And I ended up in art school in Chicago. I had a scholarship to go to an art school in Chicago and ended up there. And while I was in art school, I went to the, you know, typical wacky artists. When you're young, you're doing all kinds of stuff, experimenting in all possible ways. And one of those ways was I was literally coloring my hair every possible color you imagine. And there was a salon that was specialized in that type of thing in kind of the funky artsy part of Chicago. It was called Melio's and I ended up meeting this girl there started dating her for a short period of time, but I would always be in the salon because of her and then me getting my hair cut. And I started to really like the vibe. So after a couple semesters of art school, of which I despised art school, I hated every minute of it. I hate, I'm the artist that hates being told what to do. So I quit, got into a fight with a professor of mine and walked out that day and walked across the street and stood in front of a salon while there was a gentleman on the phone that I figured worked there. And I just stood there staring at this guy until he got off the phone and he looked at me and goes, can I help you? And I asked him, I said, do you work here? He goes, yeah, I own the place. And I said, what does it take to be a hairdresser? Like, I don't really know what it takes. And he goes, why? And I said, I'm kind of interested in it. I said, I've been doing art next door for a while and I'm just, I think I want to make a change. And he said, come in. And we sat down and we talked the entire rest of the day. That was about 11 o'clock in the morning. I remember it like it was yesterday. And by the time I was done having a conversation with him, I had a job. And I was basically a grunt. I would go get everybody coffee and sweep the floors because I didn't have a license. I couldn't touch anybody at that time. And just did that for a while just so I could pay my rent. And then I went to hair school and got my degree and ended up having the <laughs> again it was a miserable experience at that time but i had the luxury of working under one of the pioneers of the female hairdressers there's a woman in chicago her name is marion strokirk and i got to assist her and learn under her for about two and a half years and then you know i ended up moving down here when i met a woman and started my whole career down here and it's just exploded since then but long story short i was supposed to play football and i didn't and became a hairdresser. I'll get some photos of you so viewers <laughs> can actually visualize. But uh, I had forgotten that you uh, were a football player, despite the fact that you, you know, when you look at you, you'll be like, wow, I bet he's played football. 
I affectionately call you the Viking <laughs> because you are from Upper Minnesota, which, you know, those are I your people. Out, did um, I tell you that I found out my genealogy? I'm actually a Viking. I never realized that. I mean, I always knew that I had a little bit of it, but yeah. I found out that there's a whole bunch of it in my uh, bloodline. That does not surprise me. Like, you've seen a mirror, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the red hair, though. That's the one thing I don't have. That's all right. But you, yeah, you're, you're still a Viking and yeah, you're, what are you? Six, four, six, five, yeah, six, four. Yeah. Very large. It's funny. You know, when I painted one of the things that was the vein of my existence when I would do my paintings was the hair because it had to be so meticulous to be able to get it to really show the dimension that that type of, I mean, portraiture is a whole different level of painting. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I, my wife ended up having a, a client of hers the other day who's an astrologer so she did my birth chart and i found out that i have a lot of leo and whatever the moon rising whatever whatever the thing is that presents to everyone else i am a leo well leos are like the kings and the gods of the hair world so it's literally like every like aspect of my life i can't get away from hair there's three signs i guess so there's a sign that you present yourself to there's a sign that you feel that you are that you hide from everybody you know mm-hmm. so it's like your insecurities and then there's the actual like what you are from your from your month I mean, that's what i took out of my thing when you're at these uh fashion weeks in new york or miami have you styled any named models that one might recognize typically so yes but also probably not unless you're in the actual industry So most of the time, like the big name models, so like, for example, the Moschino show, Alexandra Ambrosio, the Victoria's Secret model, one of the beautiful brunettes, she was there. I got to work on a beautiful model. Her name's Ducky. She's she's this gorgeous, gorgeous black girl. She literally looks like a porcelain doll. She's just stunning. I got to work on her and that was super fun because she's just she's freakishly beautiful. But there's tons. There's another girl there. Her name's Isabelle. But those types of girls, like the really big, big names, and even the guys, like the key hairdressers, those are their people. That's who they take care of because they've come up with the thing. They're the ones that are going to get the most press. Like that's the kind of like out of out of the 56 models, typically the key hairdresser touches and actually does like three or four of them. And then they just tweak all of the other stuff to make sure it looks right. Does that make sense? It does. So – you know, we've done last year, we did a collection, a key hairdresser named James Pecious, who's another just phenomenal world class hairdresser. That man, I think he spends most of his time in a plane flying around the world. And that show, Rock Collection, they did, I mean, that was all of the social media. So you had Kendall Jenner, you had Bella and Gigi Hadid, you had all those girls in that show. So it's. It's not sometimes. And yeah. personally speaking, I would prefer to not do those shows because when there's that many of that type of person, there's that much more chaos to have to deal with. I could imagine that that would be the, the case. Yeah, for sure. It's again, like I, like I said before, like sounds super glamorous and super fun. But when you start seeing the backside of it, it's kind of like if you ever get to go to an arena. Like arenas are really cool and there's all the lights and everything's all perfect. And then you go down and like the, <laughs> the caverns underneath it and it's not quite so pretty. It's, you know, they, there's all the things that they hide from everybody. Yeah. It's brick o block and wires running on the ceiling and fluorescent lights. and <laughs> It's just mm-hmm. functional. It's all function and no form, no form. Yes, it is. Outside of creative inspiration, there's not a lot of fun to it. I know that probably would sound weird and make people go, why would you do it? But you really do it for the creative inspiration of it because oftentimes you get to do things that no one would ever do on a day-to-day, ever. Specifically in New York. New York Fashion Week hair, there is a specific style to it. It's usually flatter and I'll get out. And it's got this super subtle, barely there wave in the middle of the strand of hair. And their intention for that is, I was told one day, was is the fact that they want the model to look like she's so put together from head to toe because of her wardrobe that all she needs to do is this super subtle, barely there bend and put a lip on. And that's all she needs. And she's like spot on. That makes sense. 
because they want all the attention on the clothes, right? Yes. Like, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I, you know, you've done bridal photography for a long time. And it's like, how many times have you heard a model talk about, or a model, a bride talk about how she didn't want her her hair to be overpowering of her dress or her makeup to be overpowering of her dress. Like she wants her dress to be the focal point and everything has to accentuate that. So yes, which is another reason on the pre-wedding day bridal portrait session, I very rarely had a bouquet in the shot. Right. Because that's one more element of beauty to distract the eye from the bride herself. Hair is totally an illusion. Everything that a hairdresser does, whether they're backstage or they're behind the chair in a salon or whatever, hairdressers chase rainbows. Like, it's all illusions. It's all trial and error all the time. doesn't matter how many times a person's done the person's hair. It's always trial and error in some way, shape, or form. This is Collected Clan. I'm your host, Gregory Byerline. Thank you for listening to these conversational biographies about real life with relatable guests. We operate on a listener-supported system, so the conversations remain honest and real without beholding to companies or products. Instead of interrupting the show with paid advertisements unrelated to our mission, we prefer to promote non-profit organizations selected by our guests. If you find value in what we're doing here on Collected Clan, please visit our website at www.collectedclan and click the support tab to learn how you can financially support this show for as little as $5 a month. Thank you for your support. And now back to this conversation. So you have a client comes in, sits in your chair that you've never styled before. What are you looking for in their features that they bring with them that determines how you cut and style their hair? Yeah. So what are um, some cues? There's physical cues for sure. So, you know, we got to look at the cheekbones. We got to look at how large their actual head is. There's much more graceful way to describe that, you know, talking to the client. But the truth is we're just trying to see how big your head is. We are looking at hairlines, you know, trying to determine, you know, where, if it's a very low hairline, if it's a receding hairline, if you have a widow's peak in the middle, if you have any cowlicks around the hairline, same thing in the back and the nape, you're, you're looking at all these different things. What you're trying to do is, is you're trying to accentuate the things that are going to make a person look really good and hide the things that they are, they don't like. Everything that a person has two of, so your eyes, your nostrils, your ears, your hands, every body part that you have two of, one is a different size than the other one, and it will be lower. One will be higher. So, for example, if a woman has a bang, even, even a man, if they have a bang and their left eye is lower and you part the hair on the right-hand side and drag the bang over to the left-hand side, the left eye will look even lower than it's already. But if you take and part it on the left side and drag it across to the right side, it'll give this optical illusion now to where they look balanced and straight. So you're basically trying to do that in every way, shape, or form. Now, what I personally do that has helped my career get to where it is, is that stuff is very important. But I'm also trying to figure out the person, figure out their personality, figure out what they do for a profession, what they need their hair to be, because I can give someone a great hairstyle, but if they don't have the personality and the comfort and the strength to pull something off, it doesn't matter how good of a job that I do or anybody, they're not going to be able to pull it off. You know, if a woman's not a super strong woman and she comes in and she wants a pixie, it's probably not going to go really, really well. Like a pixie is a super short very sexy hairstyle nowadays that people are doing but if she's not got the confidence and the strength behind her to do that it just won't work more so than the rest of it that's what i'm looking at so let's say a low confidence woman comes in and says hi tony nice to meet you i would like a pixie cut what do i say yeah what do you say (laughs) or do well i will go through all of the different things and i will talk to them and try and figure out like really and truly like the truth of the truth truth like you know how i am like sitting with me i'm very like i become ground level with people we talk about stuff and i don't have a problem getting into the nitty-gritty of what makes a person tick and i absolutely don't have any issue telling someone that i won't do it 
I mean, I've done it many, many times. I won't put my name on something that's not going to look good. So people can actually sit there and tell me all day long that they want something. But if it's not going to, if it's not going to work, I'm not going to do it. I think we should do something else. And here's why. And then they, you get buy-in or do you get kickback? How often do you get kickback? No, I really want this. I, I wouldn't say that I get kicked back very often. I will have people come in and they will want something so badly. Here's here's an example. Here's the most common thing that I deal with on a regular basis. Women will come in and they'll, be, they'll open a magazine or they'll pull up Pinterest. I want this haircut. Okay. Tell me why you want this haircut. Well, I love the way it looks and I love the way it does. And it's typically some celebrity. Okay. And I'm like, okay, cool. And here's the here's the catch. Here's the thing that I get them completely derailed from their thing with. And I'm like, what is your commitment? How many times are you willing to do your hair a week? And how long are you willing to do it every day? In some way, shape, or fashion. It comes out many different ways every single time. But basically, every time I'm asking them is, cool, are you committed to actually styling this hairstyle? And they're like, well, not really. And I'm like, because there is a hairdresser four feet from them in this photo every single time and every photo you've shown me is styled by a hairdresser so unless you're going to come in every single day and get a blowout which i'm all about you have to style it to make it look that way because hair doesn't naturally look that way it just doesn't and most of the time people are like oh well then what do you think i should do and that's usually the transition of okay i never thought of it that way I don't want to do that because I know myself well enough. So what else are the options? And I've only had a couple times where people, and I've done here 19 years. I've only had a couple times where people literally fought me on something to where I'm like, I'm not your hairdresser. You know, I'm not telling you that you can't do this. Obviously it's your hair, but I'm not the guy to do this. So I, if you'd like to have a referral from somebody else here, that's totally cool. Or, you know, have at it. So. Well, even, even, you know, just a couple in 19 years, that's, that's pretty good odds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just have to get personal with people and you have to tell them the truth. Everybody that sits in my chair knows that there's two things that they are guaranteed. I'm not going to lie to them about their hair ever. And I'm never going to sell them a product that they don't need. And I have built my clientele and built my business based on those principles so when people sit in my chair and I tell them that or they refer somebody that hasn't seen me and they come to my chair, the first thing that they say nowadays, I don't even have this experience much anymore. Nowadays, people come into my chair and they just sit down. And they're like, what do you think I should do? Which is a really cool experience to have. But they, it's that way because I've held myself in this ethical way that, you know, for me, I just can't see doing it any other way. But, you know, this industry can be pretty gnarly and just sell 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 and i get to travel around the country and teach hairdressers all the time as you know i'm gone three weekends out of the month sometimes and there's some really bad hairdressers in this world <laughs> really bad well i can speak from direct experience that i have sat in your chair multiple times and you say well what do you want to do today and i'll be like you know what there's a reason i'm sitting in your chair i don't want to think about it I've got a bazillion other things on my mind. I just need a haircut. Yep. And for me, that comes from a position of you are Edward Scissorhands. You are the pro at this. And then the other side is I don't want to think about it. I personally need something that I literally can roll out of bed, rub my fingers through, straighten it out a little bit, and go. As much as I would like a really cool rockability pompadour sometime, I'm not going to style that every day. Right. It's just not going to happen. Right. No, I, I totally get that. And that's part of it. You know, I, I remember back when my wife, Gabrielle, and I first started kind of hanging out and dating each other on a more serious level. We have this mutual friend, Mary Margaret. And Mary Margaret wanted to come in and get these. And she wanted to get bangs. And I'm like, totally cool. Going to give you bangs. And I sat down with Mary Margaret and I talked to her. And then while I was talking to her, what I... What was coming very loudly to me is she wanted a longer, more sexy kind of Bridget Bardot, you know, framed in kind of bang and not like a super short bang. But my wife knew Mary Margaret way before I ever did. And at that point in time, Mary Margaret was very funky and like kind of skater chick almost in a way. 
and Gabby was like, you need to, you, you need to give her funkier bangs. You need to give her funkier bangs. And I'm like, that might've been Mary Margaret back in the day, but Mary Margaret wants to go ride horses, funky, 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 little short pixie bangs, you know, Betty page bangs on a girl that wants to go ride horses right now, specifically Mary Margaret, that isn't working like that. That doesn't fit. Like she's wearing Wranglers and Roper boots. Like, doesn't fit and she couldn't understand it and now many years later she's like i totally get it I totally get it my wife is my worst client by the way <laughs> she's the most difficult one i have out of all of them that i've ever had in my life which i guess is a very common thing i don't know that many i people that are i could um i could see that not and, and i don't mean that pejoratively about her because <laughs> i adore her um, but, I, but I know you two and you guys own a business together. Also, I could totally see, she's like, you know what? Get your hands out of my hair. <laughs> I want is, some, I want some MySpace. She is an interesting, you know, what's really funny is even like when we're doing this, like there's this, there's kind of like this play, right? Like back and forth thing. And when, when you're doing hair behind the chair in a salon, there's totally that, that give and take, like. The conversation is give and take. The energy is give and take. Like I am, I'm trying to play to the client, like feeling good about it. You know, I want to give them the best experience and I want to make them feel really good about themselves when they, when they get up and walk away. However, when my wife sits in the chair, she doesn't have, it's like completely like, no, like there's not any emotion in it. There's not, we don't have conversation because she's busy working you know, doing all the other stuff. Like that's the one moment she actually gets to sit down. And then I make this sound like she gets it done all the time. She gets like two haircuts a year. Yeah. But there's no play. So I have no idea if she likes what I'm doing. And then she'll look up at me and then I'm like, do you like it? Do you not like it? And then she'll start to futz with it. And then that makes me insecure. And it's just usually a, it's not usually a good experience, but she gets a great haircut and she's beautiful anyway. So yeah, those freckles. Oh man. (laughs) <laughs> My favorite thing. Let's take a quick break for this episode's nonprofit spotlight, selected by our guest. Currently, what we are, who we're working with, we're working with a woman. We came across this woman. Her name is Tammy Roth, and she does kind of some out of the ordinary rehabilitation for women that have, you know, recovering from drug abuse, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera. And she does some really kind of unconventional things in helping these women heal. And we do a lot of work with her. Her group is called Her Circle Recovery Meditation Group. And they actually do a lot of the recovery stuff through meditation and alternative forms, which Gregory, as you know, goes right hand in hand with our well house. And that's who we're working with now. We have in the past worked with Thistle Farms, which is very similar in a lot of ways, works with women who have been through the ringer. (laughs) Yeah. And they're amazing. And we try to share it around and we try and work with the smaller ones, not because we don't like the big ones, but we try and work with the smaller ones because oftentimes they get kind of overlooked because the big ones are so good at what they do. Um, So we're constantly trying to find little ones. And this woman, Tammy, is who we're working with now. She's doing some great stuff. To learn more about Circle Recovery Meditation Group and the work Tammy Roth does there, please visit www.hercirclerecovery.com. That's her, H-E-R, circlerecovery.com. Tony also mentioned Thistle Farms, a fantastic organization whose mission is to heal, empower, and employ women survivors of trafficking, prostitution, and addiction. Learn more at thistlefarms.org. Now let's return to our conversation as we explore another side of our guest, Tony Caldwell. Well, there's another aspect of you that you have hinted at when we've hung out and we've talked that uh, I want to explore a little bit, and that is your... Uh, you have a very high interest in martial arts and self-defense and, and that sort of thing. Tell me about that a little bit. Like, where does that come from and how does it come into play in your everyday life? Uh-huh. Because his, here, here's here's the catalyst to that. One day you were cutting my hair and you had said something. Now, Now, keep in mind, you have these big football player hands and you've got shiny pointed metal objects 
<laughs> near veins in my head and you for somehow we got onto conversation and you simply said that there is a way that with your bare hands you could take someone out and i'm going well this is fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah and There's fascinating um and and clearly that type of information not i mean it's not anything that you would want to use but if you ever needed to i guess it would would come in handy so that's the the overarching context to what what I'm curious about this whole martial arts and self defense mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. So strangely enough, I met my wife in this martial art a couple of years after I'd started. But point is, I met her there. I actually I moved to Nashville and I missed the physical contact of football. There is a natural aggressive side to me that I just I enjoy that physicality. And I was looking for something. I knew I didn't want to do Taekwondo. I knew I didn't want to do karate. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I met this gentleman. He was a very dear friend of mine. He's since deceased, but he was a wonderful man in town by the name of Mike Jones. And he owned a company called Guardian Angels Driver Service, where he would come and pick you up and drive you in your car wherever you needed. And this was way before the time of Uber. And just from me going out partying and not wanting to drive i got to know this guy really really well and come to find out this guy is a really high up belt rank in this martial art and we you know we would sit and talk and at that point in time i used to smoke and i'd stand outside and have a cigarette with him and he'd tell me all these stories about this stuff and i'm like can can like anybody come watch this like is it like, how can I find out more about this? He's like, yeah, sure, come come check it out. Well, right about that time, there was a, a man by the name of Chuck Corey that was moving from Detroit down here. And Chuck Corey is, like, one of the foremost authorities in this martial art. And this martial art is called Sansu. And Sansu is a Chinese martial art that has been around for thousands of years. It has been passed down through the lineage lines of the the guards for the emperor of China. It was not supposed to be taken outside of China. However, when the Japanese invaded China, the family that had the textbooks had a young son. His name was, well, in Chinese, his name was Chin Su Dek, and they sent him to America, and he changed his name to Jimmy Wu. And Jimmy lived in San Francisco, and Jimmy taught Chuck. And that's how this martial art made it to the United States. And it is basically the core principles of every single close quarters combat like special forces style martial art that you can possibly think of kind of has its roots in some way shape or form from sansu like it it covers all bases in every possible way and it's just absolutely brutal and i started training in it and i started training with chuck and chuck moved my group along quite quickly and it's just, you know, my, my best buddy, Mason, he was in it. He mastered out a couple of years ago, and that was really fun. I didn't, I haven't mastered out yet. That's something that I would like to do at some point in time. I had to stop because of logistics, and I opened a business and all that jazz. So I just didn't have time to go down. But Sansu is basically the art of fighting. That's the simplest way to put it. The term Sansu means fighter. There's... <laughs> There's nothing more to it. So basically, <laughs> when when I started learning how to do Sansu, like I was learning how to become a fighter. And what that has done for me is, is obviously, if you're learning a martial art from a practitioner that actually is coming from a really wholesome place, you are being taught how to never, ever have to use it. There are things that I know how to do to the human body that would absolutely make about anybody cringe. And I have learned more on how to never have to use it unless I absolutely have to. And that was the sign of a great teacher. That's the sign of a great martial artist is it builds the confidence and the intelligence to know how to get yourself out of a a scenario if something is going to happen. But if something were to happen and I knew that I needed to do something, I, there is not an ounce of me that is worried about it in any way, shape or form. Yeah, and I think I think you had mentioned that it was the context that we were talking about of being able to do something, but also being able to not do something. Yes, and you being able to, to choose yeah. to not do what you know how to do. 
yeah, you have a split second. I mean, when you get to the level that we were at doing this martial art, you basically have a split second to decide whether you are going to incapacitate someone and hold them till the authorities get there. You have a split second to decide whether or not they are actually trying to do lethal body harm to you, which means, okay, do I want to do lethal body harm back to them? What are the implications of that? How am I going to handle it after if I do have to do that to somebody? You know what I mean? Like you have, you have such a minuscule amount of time to decide what you're going to do to someone because all in all, if someone comes to attack you, knowing this martial art, the fight is going to last probably at the absolute most five seconds. Hmm. So if you think about how fast five seconds is, you have to have it decided before you ever actually start whatever you're going to do on what you're going to do to that person to, or, you know, what is the scenario? The way I feel about it is if somebody's trying to do bodily harm to me, which if they're trying to fight me and just hurt me, that's one thing. But if they pull a knife on me or they pull a gun on me, you know, then all bets are off. Yeah. How many times have you ever heard the story about the big guy? Everybody wants to pick a fight with the big guy. And I've actually not ever had to really truly defend myself all that much because I'm usually able to get the point across pretty quickly. But knowing what I know has raised the confidence level so high and there's this desire nowadays for everything to get cross-pollinated. The whole like craze of the UFC and mixed martial arts, which is amazing. It's it's so, so, I, I love to watch it. But because of that, there's like this need and this want to take and cross pollinate it. And if you don't cross pollinate with all the other martial arts, well, then and you don't get in the ring and fight, you know, well, then you're just basically spreading this lie. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, it well, it makes sense to someone who just simply does not follow UFC and MMA. <laughs> right. But I know what it is. And that's the extent of it. And that's a, and that's enough, because my, my point is, is. There is a dramatic difference between a sport and knowing how to fight in a sport and a scenario where somebody's trying to kill you. There is a dramatic difference between the two. I know many, many, many military soldiers that do not have the aptitude to fight. They will hunker down and they will hide. One in ten has the aptitude where they will actually like throw over and like start firing away. My buddy, I have a very dear buddy of mine. He was a civilian contractor over in Afghanistan, and he ended up getting a job driving around a ambassador over in Afghanistan because he was just one of the contractors in the convoy. And the convoy went and became under fire, and he was the only person out of all of them that had the aptitude to get in the driver's seat and take off. Kept so his he, cool. all, he all of a sudden now has the job where he's the driver, which turned into a huge job, and I would never want that, but he was one of... Again, one of ten. But like someone that. skilled to do something, but so skilled at that something that he knows when not to use it mm -hmm. and when to use it. Mm -hmm. Once you learn this stuff, you start to realize just how delicate and how human life is extremely delicate. It does not take much to take a life. It does not take much to hurt somebody. There's bones in the body that you think are the most strong bones ever, and it only takes two pounds of force to break it. There's all these misconceptions about all this stuff, and that a lot of people, including myself, before I learned this stuff, we, we, we think we're one way, and we're a completely different scenario. I am trained to balance adrenaline dumps. Like That's part of our training is like how do you continue working when your adrenaline spikes because adrenaline is an amazing drug. It makes everything so much more heightened. You want to talk about how does a human use more of its brain power because we use so little, that's how they do it. If we could literally run off of adrenaline, we would use way much more. But we don't, so when it dumps, everything short circuits, right? So I got part of our training is how you deal with that. Well, I went to a gun range probably a year ago, and I was the only guy in the gun range, and the marshal in there was like, you want to do some drills? And I'm like, sure. And he's like, what I want you to do is I want you to take, put five rounds in your magazine and I want you to take and put three rounds center mass when I tell you to start. And what he, the drill was, is he put the target 10 yards in front of me. And when he beeped me, which they have a beeper, but that they can actually, you can hear through your ear protection. Mm -hmm. 
when he beeped me, he pushed the button and the target ran at me at the rate of somebody running at me. Okay, so here I am. I have a lot of experience with handguns and rifles and all that stuff. I have a lot of experience in controlling adrenaline and everything. And I did this drill over and over and over again. And I could not stop doing this thing. And what the thing was, was is I, when he beat me, I picked up the gun and I fired all five rounds and my finger was still trying to pull more rounds. So in a handgun, when the gun goes empty, the slide of the top of the gun slides back and it locks. Like it can't fire anymore because there's nothing in there. I was still trying to fire bullets every single time. And that's coming from a guy who's trained in how to deal with this stuff. And the assignment was only to fire three times? Only three. And I would always go through five. And I was still trying to fire more. So it gave me compassion for scenarios you always hear in the media. The media always wants to go down these rabbit holes with people and talk about how police officers, and yes, there's some bad apples. You know, why does a police officer have to fire 15 rounds in somebody? Well, there's a lot of information that we don't know. And having experienced that drill, I can totally understand why they do. I don't know what it's like to run around with a job with people trying to kill me every day. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's fascinating stuff. L- largely fascinating because I know so little about it. So my curiosity streak is like, ooh, yeah, yeah, tell me some more. I think that's cool that that is a, it's just another layer to you. Uh, easiest way to put it is, is I got taught how to fight the phone book. That's basically what Sansu is, is it basically teaches you how to take care of every possible scenario that you could come up with inside of a phone booth. Hmm, interesting. Let's now turn the page in this conversational biography to discuss his entrepreneurial journey that led to opening his own salon and wellhouse with his wife, Gabrielle. Well, you had mentioned earlier that you and your wife have a business now. Talk to me a little bit about your entrepreneurial experience and the road that it took you to have a salon of your own. My, my entrepreneurial experience, is, uh, it's been 11 years. I started planning a salon 11 years ago. The first time I tried to open a salon, it fell through. Um, they put a gym in the spot I was supposed to sign a lease on the day of. Was that here in Nashville or elsewhere? Yep. No, that was here in Nashville. And then I tried to do it again. I wanted to put a salon down in the Gulch, and that's actually the space where they put Barry's Boot Camp. Um, and that one fell, you know, obviously fell through. And then, you know, this just it, it, timing was amazing. We opened a salon and wellness spa although we hate the term spa, it's more of a wellhouse, but it's called Osho Collective. It's over in Berry Hill here in Nashville, and it's it's very unique. It's fun for me with all my Nashvillians that come in because they're like, this is so not Nashville. You know, this is something that you would see in L.A. or something you would see in New York, you know. It it's, does feel very L.A. It's very wide open. It's very, you know, like I said earlier, we try to take care of all of the details that mattered, so... My intention was is I wanted to I wanted it to look and feel like we took care of all the things that mattered and didn't do any of the things that didn't. So a lot of times you'll go into salons and it's a lot of fluff crystals or chandeliers and it's very bougie looking and I just didn't want that. I wanted a place that was really artsy. I wanted it to look very modern and clean, but I also wanted it to be very timeless. And I, I think we did a really great job. We had an amazing architect here in Nashville, Nick Dryden who's super famous and he was gracious enough to help us with our design and it's just it's awesome but it has been a process it was very difficult we had virtually every type of road bump and block that you could possibly imagine we basically got told that we were going to get shut down for nine months because of a code and zoning issue that we then figured out how to clear up in eight weeks excuse me in eight days that was the magic of my wife um we have just rocked it's been great it's been an absurd amount of work it's the hardest thing that i've ever done being a boss is by far the most difficult thing that i've ever done by far like there's absolutely no question to it i do two a days in football practice a hundred times over i go through all the grueling like training that i've done both in hair and then in the martial art a million times over being a boss you cannot prepare for it it's kind of like I think you would you would know more about this obviously than I would, but I think it's probably very similar to the concept that you could never truly prepare to have a child. You, you really can't, prepared, <laughs> but you really can't ever be prepared for it. That is very true. 
we've actually gotten to the point now where we we're just now looking at what does it look like now to grow so business is great success awesome what's next is it bigger space is it a second location is it a different business what is the what, what would that be you know all these questions and we have our mentors we have a mentor in san diego we have a mentor in atlanta we have mentors all over the place that we use to help us with that and where that's where we are now trying to figure out where and what we're going to do next and truthfully we haven't a clue and at this point you don't necessarily need one because need one, it will reveal one, one, itself or you will dig deep enough to develop a clue yes exactly Yes, yes, you're totally right. It's really kind of cool. We started working with this guy, Matt, out in San Diego, one of our mentors, and he it's a fascinating story. He built this business basically helping people come up with their dream. Like, what is it actually? Like, if you take away all the bullshit that you try and disguise something with, like, what is it that you really want to do in life? If you had no boundaries of any way, shape, or form, what would you do? And you figure that out, and then after you figure that out, then you figure out why do you do it? Like, why do you want to do this? Like, how is this going to help you? How is it going to help the world? Like, what is the point? And then after you figure that out, then you go into, okay, cool. So how are we going to get there? And what's really fascinating is, is this guy who's, you know, I'm still pretty young. I'm 37. This guy is just a couple of years older than me, but he built a business out in San Diego that he was really passionate about. And what he found out was is after he built his business, he absolutely despised it. He was working 80 hour work weeks and he's a surfer. He's like, I couldn't surf. I was just miserable. All I did was work. He's like, I went through and learned to do all of these things and basically built this system that he coaches people with now. And he took his 80 hour work week and turned it into a four hour work month in two years. So what he did was, is he went through all these things and he realized, okay, for me to be able to do what I needed to do, I need to grow my business to this so I can afford the people that I need to afford to run my business the way that I want my business to be run. So he went through and he made all the steps happen to do that. And then he just kind of did his deal. And now he goes in once a month and meets with his people that run his business. And he watches and controls his business via numbers now the rest of the time. And I'm like, yes, please, because I got stuff to build. <laughs> you know what's been the most difficult thing for Gabby and I is? And, uh, and Tell me if this makes any sense. It does to us, but the projection of mom and dad has been the most difficult to deal with. And what I mean by that is, is everybody's got a relationship with their mom or their father. Okay. So if an employee has a great relationship with their mother and they have a terrible relationship with their father, they're going to have a better relationship with my wife than they will with me. I will automatically get projected as the asshole father that they hate or vice versa, right? And that has been the most difficult thing to deal with with our employees because they'll automatically try and make us mom and dad. It's the most bizarre thing. We prided ourselves on how much education we went and got and study and preparation to be as good a business owners and bosses as we could. And we were not prepared for that at all. Like that was shocking and extremely startling and difficult, very difficult. Difficult because it caught you by surprise or because difficult. it's out of your wheelhouse? Um, both. It's not our wheelhouse. It caught us by surprise. And because people have that, now instead of it just being where you're managing what people are doing, now you got to go through and manage all of their emotions and deal with all of that and Kind of like remodeling a house, like an old house. It's this beautiful looking house. And then you go to remodel something, tear it on the wall. And it's like, God, what did I find behind the wall? It's like, you think you know what you've got and then you get into it and it's a whole lot more. And it was, it was, it was a lot. It's since much, much better now because there's more experience on both sides and we're more aware. Our staff is more aware, but we were first time business owners too. You know, It's like first time parents. You can be as prepared as you want, but... You're never going to be totally ready. I, I think I'm more prepared now to have an actual physical child than I was before because I have a business that's got 13 adult children in it. 
dependents, 13 people like depending on you, not to yeah. make them diminutive into children. But no, metaphorically no, speaking, yeah, I get it. Yeah. You know, they're, everybody needs something at some point in time. And often at the same time. Yeah, uh-huh. 100%. I heard a phrase recently that uh, the fourth child essentially raises themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is totally true. There's I, I, I don't and person. won't have direct experience that because we are completely finished at three. But I chuckled when I heard that because at that point, you know, mom and dad are just done. <laughs> They're like, here, follow along. <laughs> yeah. You'll there's, learn how to put your clothes like on me. by I, watching. There's family like me where I was... I was very sick when I was born. I didn't sleep a full night until I was two. Like I came out and my family was like, okay, we're done. (laughs) No more. Uh, I want to touch on the teaching aspect of your career also. I think it's really cool that your salon and uh, wellness area are called Osho Collective because you has informed Mm -hmm. me that Osho is, remind me of the word, the, the language, but it means teacher. It's actually a crossover word. It actually transitions through most of the Asian culture. It's actually a title that's given to a monk when he gets his own monastery. So when they kind of level up and they've gone through all of, I guess, when they would master, they get their own monastery to be the head of the monastery. When you are the head of the monastery, you are considered to be an Osho. <laughs> what we needed to be very careful of when we opened was is there is a man that is very well known that took a name – He is actually a Hindu Sufi, and he took the name Osho. And unfortunately, like all good things, when he became very popular in the 60s, he had some people take his teachings and go completely off the wagon, and they were actually the people that were the first domestic terrorists of this country. And when we opened, people were like, Osho, like the cult leader? And we were like, has nothing to do with it in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. Right. I actually went to the source of what it means. But yeah, we everybody in our salon for the most part is, was, or is about to be an educator for a company, uh, myself included. And then on the wellness side, they do a lot of education over there. My wife has a protocol that she does, some energetic work that helps people. She's got a whole other division company that she's come out with with another woman named Meg. And it's called Flux Retreats, and they hold these beautiful big retreats with women, get a lot of movement with them, healing. The next one they're going to do is actually in Tulum, Mexico. She actually just got asked to do a speaking in Santa Fe at this big convention out there. So it's pretty cool. We do a lot, a lot of education in our space. That was the intention. You know, the way I feel about it, yes, I travel around and educate and my philosophy is, is if, if people aren't sharing knowledge, the world doesn't move. If I do my job well as an owner, then I have taught my staff how to go and open up their own businesses and succeed. And that's what I want. If a martial arts teacher teaches their students to be good martial artists, they will have the physical skills that are better than the master. However, the master will always have the experience. So it's always, you know, it's that kind of concept. I always want that concept to be wrapped around everything that we do because I think it just makes the world a much better place. Yeah. And we need all the help we can get right now, man. Yeah. The world right yeah. now that, is... That is true. I think I saw a documentary. Well, I know I saw the documentary and I think it might have been about this, uh, this guy that you had mentioned, this Osho guy. I got sucked into this multi-part documentary it was fascinating and i really can't explain why when i finished it, i was like huh okay and then i moved on i was like you know i'm, I'm glad i i know about that because i was alive mm-hmm. in that time frame but i was completely unaware of what was happening on in the world around me i did i don't recall the news stories or anything about it so it was completely new to me <laughs> and i chuckled when they referred to him or he referred to himself as Osho. I was like, yeah, that that's, <laughs> that could cause some problems for Tony here yeah. in Nashville. So when you said that you had, had known that on the front end, I was like, okay, yeah, you've done your homework. Oh yeah. There's actually a very large corporation based off of that guy's company that still is in existence today. 
it's really kind of sad what happens in in society sometimes. He he had some really brilliant stuff, and like everything good, people take it and they twist it, and it becomes something completely different. You know, so by the time the guy died, everything that he was connected to had already been tainted because of a bunch of other people doing stuff that he really wasn't about. And it's it's super, super sad. There, there, there's actually a brilliant video of him where he's it's very old, terrible footage. But you can look it up on YouTube if you want to laugh. It's a video of him doing a lecture to a bunch of people in this auditorium. And his lecture is how wonderful the F word is. <laughs> and it's, it's just hilarious. It's, it's one of the funniest things to just sit and listen to this guy. You know, he's, he's Hindu. So he's got a super, super deep, you know, deep accent. And it's, it's hilarious. It's really funny, you know, and we're battling that now in today's society, you know, people, people are taking stuff and they're contorting it. Tony Robbins got himself in trouble not too long ago because in one of his big, huge course, you know, things that he holds in big stadiums, there was a woman that stood up and asked him to speak about his views on the me too movement. And all he said in his response to this woman was, as he said, you know, the me too movement is an amazing thing. And he's like, it does great wonders for people that need to have a voice. He goes, however, he's like, I want everybody in here to really, truly think and to really, truly look at those that are using something as a negative. And he never said anything bad about the movement. What he was saying was for people to open their eyes and start to look at stuff. And he got absolutely demonized for that. And it's really, that's sad. It's a sad, sad world. That type of stuff bugs me. Yeah, it does me too. Because if you don't play into the narrative, then you are, you're an oppositional narrative. It's funny too, you know, it's one of the things he said when he was talking to this woman was, is the fact that it's always easy to get behind something when you're hurt. And the woman who told me about this, one of my employees actually told me about this and she told me it through her filter and how upset she was that Tony Robbins had said all this stuff and She rattled off this story, and I was like, well, that's very interesting. That doesn't sound like him at all, so I'm going to go home, and I'm going to research it myself. And I said, if if that is the way it was, I said, I'll be very upset about that because I actually very much respect that guy. I think he does some really good stuff. And I got home, and what's very fascinating is the fact that the only part of her story that was accurate was, was the fact that he did speak about the Me Too movement. But none of the rest of it was the way it was. She's got her own hurt and her filters filtered it the way she needed to filter it. And that wasn't at all what he was saying. And it was exactly what he's talking about. It's easy to jump behind stuff when you're hurt. There's a lot of application right there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Especially in the social media and meme culture that we're in these days. It's like the topic and flavor of the day, yep. not to downplay the importance of discussing whatever the topic may be, no. but it just gets run through the ringer so much and people start, they don't actually go back like you did to find out what was originally said. It becomes the game of telephone and then it just quickly spirals into something that it wasn't. Yep. Um, you know, what's really fascinating about the Me Too movement. You'll, you may find this interesting. One of the things that is very fascinating about the Me Too movement is is in my chair, in the salon, or outside, any of the people that I actually communicate with on the regular, the only people that I have ever heard ridicule, dog, talk poorly about the Me Too movement, any of that stuff, are the really strong, really, really mature older women. Hmm. Whatever, whatever somebody would want to say older is, I, I don't really classify older as a lot of what people consider old. I mean, hell, I have staff members that are calling me old. I'm 37. <laughs> Freaking me out because they don't you know, are old. They don't know Britney Spears. And I'm like, oh, my God, if you don't know Britney Spears, what else don't you know? Like, it's just creepy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I at least knew the stuff like from way you long before me. So anyway. Well, um, and, and, yeah, and to but, your credit, the stuff long before you was worth knowing. <laughs> accurate, accurate. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't go against that. But yeah, these women, 
they're really upset about this whole thing and it's not they they again they don't downplay it but what they don't get down with is the fact that there's nobody speaking up against the fact that there's a lot of people who will go through a lot of effort to make themselves look a certain way they act a certain way and then when something happens to them based on the way they have made themselves be they cry that something has happened to them and these women are look these women are looking at them going what do you think's going to happen and it makes them very angry and i think it's very fascinating because a lot of times people automatically assume men will be ridiculed i've never heard one man talk bad about that and about the whole do, me too movement mhm yeah not not out of you know my group of guys like I, I don't have a bunch of assholes in my group, so I'm sure there are, you know, horrible individuals that would want to talk poorly about it. But, like, it, it's it's a very interesting thing to look at. That would be fascinating conversations to be a fly on the wall. Wouldn't it? And I mean, especially from my perspective, because I am a very, very curious person, and I like to hear people's stories. And I've spent enough time in my career in marketing and advertising that... I'm always interested in what the herd does or will do. I've often said I've, I've called myself an armchair sociologist because I'm interested in why groups of people do things that groups of people do, not so much the individual, but yeah. the collective. Mm -hmm. So I am deeply fascinated by this can of worms that you have opened <laughs> in, <laughs> in grouping the quote, older women and their perspective through their years lived and the wisdom they have gained and the life stages that they've lived through and the battles they've survived, the failures that they've had, the different social mores that they've grown up in because they've seen a lot of just societal change. So they bring to the table a lot more experience in life. Yep. than a younger person would, which yeah, is is still important to have that younger idealistic perspective. But man, I, I would like to sit on that wood bench next to your chair and yeah, hear yeah. that conversation, but then have a younger person come up and join in the conversation. And I would just pop some popcorn and I would just sit and listen. That would be it's, fascinating to me. It It is really fascinating. And one of the most... One of the things that I try and teach, I try anybody that wants to listen to me and we're talking about life or anything like that, or any of my employees or, you know, I mean, you and I have had this conversation in my chair is everything in life has a balance. Everything. The ecosystems have balances. There is a positive, negative energy. Everything has a balance. And if it's not kept in balance, it doesn't work. So obviously it's not going to be around if it's not in balance, which is really hard to grasp in a lot of ways because there's a lot of really evil things in the world, but there's a lot of really good things. Yeah, there's a lot the of way, really good things going on too. But unfortunately, the way the mind works, the mind only remembers the bad. There's scientific studies that they will do with people's minds where they will go back and ask them, like, name all of the horrific things that have happened to you in your life, and they will write down a list numerous items long and then they ask them right after that to go through and write all the good things and they may maybe write one or two the mind just doesn't remember that stuff because the the bad is painful right and we're taught in our society today we're taught and we're so saturated with fear and this and that one of the things that i think that is really unfortunate for the millennial generation is is the fact that they're not taught consequences necessarily so they're not taught the fact that there is a balance. They're not taught the fact that, yeah, you can be mad about something and you can say something horrible to somebody else, but guess what? There's going to be a repercussion to that. They're not mm -hmm. taught that stuff. They don't think that way. They think that everything should be perfect, that everybody should be spoken about. And I don't disagree in some ways. Like I don't think anybody should be spoken about in a derogatory, disrespectful way. But everybody has to have their own label. It gets daunting. It's like, well, good God, you can't talk about people anymore. Like, you know, everybody's got a group that they have to fit in. And 
it just becomes overwhelming. And if you don't do it, well, then you're a closed minded, you know, you're an asshole. You're yeah, you're, you're narrow minded or you're a prude or you're not mm-hmm. open minded or you're not progressive or or, or whatever the, right. the badge of honor is for the day. Right. And I just try and teach people and get them to open their eyes to balance. That's it. Nothing more than that. Don't have to get into any of the social issues. Just understand that there's always more to it and there's a balance to it. And this woman, that my employee that I was speaking about the other day, she actually was blowing out my wife's hair the other day and she looked at Gabby. She's like, I had another really intense conversation with Tony today. And she's like, oh yeah? She goes, how'd that go? She goes, I'm actually starting to realize that there's just a lot more to everything. And that's cool. Like you, you know, yeah. people don't have to agree with you. They don't have to, they don't even have to like what you say. But the thing is, is like, why don't people just start to listen to everybody? And maybe there's going to be a little teeny mm. nugget in everything that they might take and go, huh? Oh, yeah, I can get down with that. Or I don't like that. Like, I don't, you know, our president today, I don't like our president. I don't dislike our president. I like some of the stuff he does and I don't like some of the stuff he does but I don't have to like him. I don't have to hate him. And I don't understand why it can't be that. Like everybody's going to mess up sometime. Everybody's going to do good sometime. Have you ever heard of a book called the science of getting rich? I'm not a guy an author by the name of Wallace Waddle. Mm-mm. Anyway, in his book, he's talking about manifestation in many different ways and shapes, but he was one specific paragraph. He was speaking about how you can take two young he used men as a reference. He said, you can take two young men from the same neighborhood, have them start with nothing in their life, have a terrible life, give them the exact same materials and the ability to attain everything that he wants to attain. And one will do well and one will do badly. Why did the one do badly? Is it because he was destined to do badly or did he just not choose to do the other things that the other one that succeeded did? And I was like, that's deep. Yep. That's deep. He just didn't choose that. He chose a different path. He had the ability to choose that. He could have seen that the other guy was being successful, but he chose this. And that that goes across all cultures. And I thought it was pretty powerful. It, it does. I'm thinking back to what you said in the Tony Robbins part of the conversation mm-hmm. a few minutes ago. I thought it was super cool that you said that you went back to what he actually said. And I think there's a really good life application that is timely for literally the day we are in because we are months away from midterm elections. And last election, which happened to be the presidential election, the general election, I got to where the only way I could stop the madness was to turn off the people talking about what the candidate said and listening to what the candidate said. Right. So uh, I either tried to watch the debates live or I would stay off of any media news outlet, social media, whatever, until I could catch the replay because I only wanted to hear what the candidates said. I didn't want to hear the analysis of what the candidate said. Right. Because I didn't want an interpretation. I didn't want to outsource my thinking yeah. to someone else. Um, uh, and, and right now the media is, I mean, if I didn't own a business right now, I think what I would probably do right now is try and figure out a way to like start this big, huge campaign that boycotted the media, like for real, like for real, for real, because they are running rampant with absolutely no control. They can say right now whatever they want to, at least back in the day. I I remember when I was a kid, they at least when they did some type of reporting, they had to cite the source. Right. Nowadays, they don't even have to cite the source. They say, well, there's a source, you know, that says this. Well, whatever. And they're ruining people's lives. Then they're not held in. There's zero account for it. They're not holding anybody accountable for anything that they're saying. And the masses of people are just going along and listening to all this stuff. And it's so disheartening and it's so dangerous, which is why when I hear things, I'm not going to discredit somebody, but I want the proof. 
right. which is why I go back and I watch, or I go back and I listen, or I research. I research everything. It's a major problem in my marriage with my wife because she's like, you literally research all the time. It's annoying. And I do because I want to be educated. I want to know, and I have to for my job. You know, when I stand yes. behind somebody's chair, I have to know all types of different things. I got to be able to talk sports with my dudes. I got to be able to talk politics. I got to be able to talk about pop culture. I got to be able to talk about all this stuff. So, but people don't, they don't research anymore. They don't listen to the things that they should be listening to. They get all of their bullshit from social media, like you said, or all of this other stuff. And now we have a world of sheep. Yep. And given all of the different pulls on my schedule, my curiosity, I, I literally have to keep it at bay because I would fall into that research and read. I'll, I'll yeah. call it a trap because for me it would be a trap because I wouldn't be able to be productive anywhere else. I would not be a present father. I wouldn't be a present husband. I wouldn't get my work done during the day or, or what have you. I wouldn't be able to create um, the ideas that I want to pursue photographically or even conversationally. I mean, this this is an extension of things I've wanted to be creative in. So I've I've gotten to the point where I was like, you know, there are so many books and there are just so little time, but there are things that I will dive into rabbit holes about. Right. I just have to be picky and, and choosy. I get it. So while you are currently child-free in your home. <laughs> uh, I applaud you for diving in and using what available time you have that I don't to go back to the source because there's nothing more illegible to read than a photocopy of 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 a photocopy. Of a photocopy. You know, the children's game telephone that my kids now play Molly was at a camp with Girl Scouts and they played the telephone game. She came home, she wanted to do it. I'm like, There's a legitimacy to why that game even exists. Yep. Yes, it's fun, but there's a life application to it where it really just go back to the source. Yep. What did that person say? What was the context in which that statement was made or, or what have you? And that was something that I can attribute back to my college days. I went to a what would be classified academically as a liberal arts Christian college. And okay. part of that would be like locally, it would be very similar to David Lipscomb University or Belmont. And part of the education there was a biblical studies class. And I learned a word called exegesis. Uh, E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E -S. And that literally was to go back to the original source and then apply the cultural context, language context, the audience context, who said it, to whom was it said, all that stuff, so one could properly interpret these historical documents and then apply that today. Um, and that was my first real introduction into research, like genuine research. And that's just kind of stuck with me. And honestly, it was kind of what carried me through the last election season two years ago was turning off the talking heads and going back to the source, plugging my own brain in and making a decision Yep. Uh, from there. And, yep. and a lot of times that included conversation with people I respected, uh, with people that I disagreed with, with people that I did agree with, um, I wanted to look at it from all sides. Yep, yep. And there, you know, there's a real life application for that. There, there is, and it goes right back to what Tony Robbins said in that thing. He was like, you know, it's always easy to jump behind something when you're hurt. And I think what ties into that in today's society is we are a world of victims. We really are. We, we have devolved into that. We, we are, and there's a lot of power in that. And I think the mass of people, the followers – they just play right into that. And again, in this book I was reading this morning, he talked about the fact that if everybody were to do all of these things that he talks about in this book, all of the things to move their life forward, and it's like a recipe that is fail safe. He said, if everybody were to do this, the governments around the world wouldn't be able to control the people. They would have to modify and do things differently because they wouldn't be able to stop people from progressing and moving forward. 
And I thought that was a really powerful thing because this book was written a long time ago. This is not like it's a new age book. This is not psychically written, but it's got a lot of foresight in it and it's got a lot of validity to it right now. And it's, it's really interesting to read. Like, was it written like a hundred years ago, 50 years ago? I, I'm not clear. I haven't looked at it. I just know that it wasn't written super. Wasn't written last year. No. I mean, the guy's name is Wallace Waddle for God's sake. <laughs> I bet there's only one person on the planet with that name. <laughs> well, being the only person on the planet with my name, I, I've often joked that if I want to be found, I can be found. And if I w don't want to be found, I can still be found. That's <laughs> yes, true. I, I can't hide. It's true. It's funny. When I was, I was born in Georgia, and then I was raised on Canadian border, Minnesota. And up north, like my last name, Nobody has it up there. Like you look in the phone book of the big, big, like national registry phone book or whatever, the city registry. And there's like 10, 12 people with my last name. <laughs> you come down to the South and there's like 50 pages. Of cold walls. Yeah. So I'm like, man, I'm blend in down here. Yeah. Like yeah. You can I'm a giant, and then, you know, come in on my, on my Viking ship. Well, this has been a great conversation, as suspected, a long overdue <laughs> conversation. Uh, where can people learn more about you and your work if they wanted to follow along or do a little research on you? Yeah, they can go to oshocollective.com. You can go there. You can check out our space. You can check out our website. It's got all the information about that part of my life. You can follow me on Instagram, Tony Caldwell Hair. I will admit I am not as good on the social media as I should be, mainly because it is daunting amount of time that I don't have, and I'm too cheap to pay someone to do it for me. But those are two places. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you. You and I have known each other for at least 10 years, years now. Yeah, man. Long um, time. I, I look forward to my monthly time at, at your chair and beneath your shears grateful for your friendship and have been excited to watch your steady meteoric rise to where you are thank you i think i have followed you under three roofs at least three now, yep, yep, yep. With, my, with my own three yep but i i appreciate it i i look forward very much when i get to see you come in and it's just fun to have good people you know that's so. what it's all about that it is my friend <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. It was a lot of fun. Well, good. I'm glad. There you have it. A real-life conversational biography with Tony Caldwell. For more of these conversations, subscribe now at collectedclan.com slash follow or wherever you get your podcasts to never miss an episode. It's free to listen. Be sure you visit the show notes for this episode at www.collectedclan.com slash Tony Caldwell for photos, videos, and additional info related to this episode. And I'd love to hear from you. What did you love about this show? Drop us a note at collectedclan at gmail.com or by voice at 615-592-5017. Your thoughts and feedback are always welcome. You're also invited to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Search for Collected Clan and we'll be there. And a big shout out to my friends Worldwide Groove Corporation for this episode's original music. The song is Mimosa from their album Chilodisiac Lounge Volume 1. Check out more of their music at WorldwideGrooveCorporation.com. Thanks again for listening. Now go be you. <laughs>